Acts chapter 1. There we go. I'm on now. There we go. Acts chapter 1. We're going to be starting in verse 12. Starting in verse 12. We're going to be, this is the second half of a message we started last week. It's going to give us just a foundation for who the church is, how they start. Before they even receive the Holy Spirit, we're getting a sense of what it means to be the church of Jesus Christ. So starting in chapter 1, verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away, 0.6 miles away. When they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All of these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up, stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. And then Luke makes this note. Now this man, Judas, acquired a field with the wicked reward of his wickedness. Excuse me, with the reward of his wickedness. <laughs> and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama which is field of blood. Continuing what Peter was saying, For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp, his homestead, his farm, his land, May his camp become desolate, And let there be no one to dwell in it, And let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us, During all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, Beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. One of these men must become with us a witness of his resurrection. And they put forward to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, Show which of these two have, you have chosen. You have chosen. To take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that our hearts and our minds would be turned to you right now. That what we do is not merely an exercise in learning and listening. <laughs> but Father, instead we get to gaze upon the work of your Son, the work of your Spirit in these pages. In this message given to us about the nature of your church, what it looks like to be devoted to Christ as our King. Lord, would you open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear where you may be leading us to see our own sin, but greater still, to see your glory that will fill the earth like water, waters covering the sea. Lord, I pray that you would just be with me. Give me the words to say that it would all be for your glory and in yours alone. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last time I, I pointed our imagination to a throne. I recalled my own opportunity to see a throne in Cambodia. That's the throne room, the, the palace where the throne is at. It's more ceremonial 
uh, for the sake of Cambodia, which has a different kind of government system. But we understand thrones and what they represent. Throughout history, for any nation with a true throne, whoever sits on the throne rules and directs the people. They shape the culture. Citizens devote their patriotism, their love of country, to that person. They will lay down their lives for them. And for some cultures, such as the Greco-Roman culture, that so much of what we know comes from, so much of where the New Testament is at, in that culture, a throne is where the gods would sit. And that sense of deity came to earth, came to earth as they sat, as they imagined that their emperor was a god. And we see emperor worship just plaguing this world, plaguing the world where the apostles are called to reach. The first disciples are called to spread the kingdom. I mean, that's so much of why they get persecuted in the first place is because they're saying, we have a king, we have a God, and it's not Caesar. Whoever sits on the throne receives devotion, there's even a sense whoever sits on the throne in their minds receive worship, which is especially problematic when you have a very depraved human being saying they sit on the throne. But instead, we are reminded in Scripture again and again and again who sits on the throne, who is worthy to be praised. Jesus, amen? Jesus, Jesus Christ sits on the throne. But the question is, we got a little more personal because if you want to use your sanctified imaginations and imagine that the seat of your life, philosophically, um, therapeutically, metaphysically, all the fun words, right? For, for millennia, cultures have imagined that as being your heart. Some have imagined being your bowels, but that sounds weird for our illustration, so we're going to stick with the heart. It's the seat of your life. It's where your decisions come from, where your your thoughts, even before they had a concept of a brain, that, that came from your heart, your rational decisions. Everything about you flowed out of your heart, which is why even Jesus says the mouth speaks out of the overflow of the what? The heart. So if that's the seat, who's sitting on it? If that's the throne of your life, where everything you do is ruled and directed and shaped, who sits there? Is it you or Christ? Because whoever sits there, let me say it again, is ruling your life, is directing your life, shaping your life. And too many people, maybe even you, are profess professing Christ as your Savior, but not as your King. You are willing to do Christian things, to look religious and spiritual. You're willing to agree with Jesus on a bunch of things about what looks moral, where he stands on the specific issues you get all fired up about. He tells you to love your family, and you genuinely love your family. So you're willing to be, yeah, 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 Jesus, yeah, 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 yeah. But that still doesn't make him your king. That just means you agree with his politics. You agree with his morals. But that will not save you. Because you agreeing with King Jesus as you remain the king of your life, your kingdom falls, his lasts forever. So who's the king? Because if he's not the king of life, if he's not in charge, your kingdom will fall. He needs to be sitting on the throne. We're, we're starting this, we've been in this series of Acts and we're kicking this off. We're really trying to just set a bunch of the stage, these themes that take over the book and really we just want to take over our church these themes that we want to define who we are as believers individually and corporately. Start in this book, and it's, it's called Acts because historically they related to it as the Acts of the Apostles. But really we can see this as the Acts of Jesus, him continuing what he started in us. And so we see the purpose of this is that the church, the church continues Jesus' gospel mission with the Spirit, being assembled and sent from neighbors to nations. Well, this morning we're going to finish chapter 1, where the apostles are together with the disciples and Jesus' earthly family, and Jesus commands them to return to Jerusalem in verse 4. 
And this would be the place where that mission is going to get launched, where that kingdom is going to begin its spread with the Spirit. And we, we spent a whole week talking about how this, none of this is possible without the Holy Spirit. And that's going to be important to us again this morning as we speak. But this kingdom begins because the spreading of the kingdom message, the gospel message. So if you look back to that previous slide, you see the church continues Jesus' gospel mission. So this is a mission of a message. Try to say that a couple times fast, okay? I clearly didn't practice that enough. Mission of a message. This message that Jesus came, he lived, he died, he was buried, he rose, and he's coming back. And it's starting right here. But before they do that, we see that they're facing this issue. We see the disciples are facing this serious problem of the loss of Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, and the need for a new apostle. Yet even beyond this difficult situation, beyond what they're facing, our spiritual ancestors are showing us what it means, what it looks like to be called disciples. And so together, together disciples devote their lives to King Jesus and his rule in their hearts. That's what we're doing, folks. I'm not in charge of this church. Jesus is. You're not in charge of this church. Jesus is. And folks, here's the thing that we have to wrestle with this morning. Because I think for some of us, we're a fan of Jesus. We would follow him on Twitter but we're not following him with our lives. We agree with Jesus on so many crucial things, on so many issues, on so many morals that shaped who we were as our family raised us up. But in reality, Jesus is not the king of your life. He's your spiritual advisor. He's your moral guide, whatever in the world that means. But he's not your king. So that's all that Jesus wants. In fact, he can't save you if he's not your king. Because you're trusting someone else, probably yourself, being good enough, having a good enough life, protecting your family, feeling secure, leaving a legacy, all those beautiful, not bad things, but they won't save you. Only Jesus will. And he wants to be king. But what does it look like to devote your life to King Jesus? What does it look like? Well, we looked at the first one. We devote ourselves individually and corporately to the foundation of the word. To the foundation of the word. Right, Jesus, let me say that I don't want to preach this again, so I'm going to mm, book it. Jesus calls his disciples to build their lives on the foundation of the word of God, his word. And as they are facing the reality of Jesus' betrayal, these disciples stand up. They're facing this, they're struggling with it. But Peter stands up as the leader and draws their attention to a beautiful reality. And he wants to draw your attention there too. Here's what he's trying to get them to see. God has already spoken. Whatever you're facing, whatever you see in our country around us, God has already spoken about these things. He has a plan. He's not surprised. No matter how much you were on election night, he wasn't. He's not surprised. When you look across the scope of your life, like, how did we get here? And you're like, how did this happen? He's like, I knew it. I knew it. He's not surprised. He's he's in control, which gives us this comfort when we go to the Word. And God himself, the Spirit who spoke beforehand by the mouth of David, like we see here in verse, make sure I get the right verse in before, verse 16. Right? He's speaking, and in these two psalms, he's trying to draw our attention to the Word of God, to remind us that Scripture is from God, and God has given us Scripture in order to shape and direct our lives, direct us closer to Him and His will, and to shape us to become more like Him. So as we read it, we're supposed to live in the Word. Make it, let, it, let it be our home. We live in it until it lives in us, and then we live on it like food. These are the metaphors that Jesus uses over and over again throughout His Word. And I want to give you these, I gave you these three points of application, for lack of a better phrase. These 
three things we have to keep in mind as we come to the Word, individually and as the people of God. One, we have to keep Christ at center. We have to keep Him at center. We have to keep Him as the point of this whole thing. Why? Because that's what Jesus said. He said, all of it points to me. Two, we have to keep community close. Why? Because when we don't, A, we're probably going to end up reading this how we want to read it. We'll end up like Thomas Jefferson, cutting a bunch of pieces out of it that just don't fit our worldview. That can't happen if Thomas Jefferson is a member of a biblical church who loves the gospel and loves Jesus Christ and say, hey, excuse me? Right? So we need to be in the word with community close. Why? Because they're going to encourage us, but we, all, we also need you. We need you, you to speak your insights, you to speak what God is laying on your heart, to draw our attention to the things that he's placing on your soul so they can be a part of where God is leading us. And finally, keep your heart rooted in and growing in the word. And folks, this takes a day after day after day, moment by moment, drawing your attention, and your affection to the Word. That every morning as you look at the Word of God, you would see the sun rise. You would see your life. You would see your hope. You would see your future. But next, we devote ourselves individually and corporately to the fuel of prayer. Right? How do we stay devoted to Christ? How do we de- stay devoted to him as our king and thus stay devoted to his kingdom? Well, we've, we've got to be fueled by prayer. Jesus has been teaching them how to direct their focus and passion in the right direction. How do you direct that in the right direction? You go to the word of God. But here we find how Jesus has taught them to fuel their focus and passion. Prayer and a lot of it. We find those have, who have trained, been trained by, taught by, discipled by Jesus Christ in the way of Jesus Christ, immediately what do they do? Immediately they leave Jesus and what do they do? Do they start forming committees? Do they start breaking ground on a, a new church building? They fall on their knees in prayer. Look at the screen right there, verse 13, and when they had entered Jerusalem, they're in their upper room, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. And here he names the apostles, 11 of them. And then he says in verse 14, all these with one accord in this unity. I love accord because I'm a musician. And so I think harmony. I think these different notes with their own frequencies brought together to create something beautiful they could never create on their own. Maybe a cord you think of a rope. You think something that three, those three knots just together cannot be broken, echoed in Ecclesiastes. They're united. And what are they devoting themselves to? Devoting having this language of again and again, relentlessly going after, passionately going after. This, my life is laid on this. This is where I trust. This is where my confidence is. Devoting themselves to prayer. They are devoting themselves to prayer. This this is more than a moment. More than an occasional prayer thrown towards God to appease some deity. No, this is entering into, resting in, delighting in a relationship with their Heavenly Father through the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's prayer. That's the weightiness of prayer. They are continually committing their time to prayer. They, just like Jesus taught, they're going to the Father again and again and again and again and again, trusting Him and longing for Him to move and work. They're going to Him. Why does God call us, call you to such prayer? Why? I think I have to be reminded about this all the time whenever I want to wander from a life of prayer. God powerfully works through prayer both to change the world and to change your heart. Do you get that about prayer? I mean, we struggle enough to believe that God will actually hear our prayers and act on our prayers. We struggle enough with that. 
but he also is wanting to work in you. Over and over we see God inviting and calling us into prayer because he wants to use your communion with him to change what's going on around you and what's going on within you, inside of you. And so we go into prayer. I can honestly tell you, again, this is so crucial for us to understand. On those days when we're like, I don't know about prayer. I don't know that this can change anything. Well, it can change you. We need this as believers. Martin Luther, that's him on, on the right there with the nice haircut. History, Christian history moment. Martin Luther is the catalyst for the Protestant Reformation. He's the catalyst for a return to the biblical doctrine of justification or salvation, being saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. On top of that, he is revolutionary in achieving the translation of the Latin Bible into the language of everyday people, a movement that was continued in a man named Tyndale who gave us the first English Bible, which is why you have a Bible right now. They gave their lives for these things. Tyndale actually being executed. What do you, man, I'm getting too excited about that. Let's come back. Right. Let me acknowledge this. Luther is not a perfect guy. If you know anything about human history, you know anything about his writings, especially in his literature, he is far from perfect, but God used him in a powerful way. And isn't that so encouraging for you and me? As God knows all the things you think and maybe don't put on paper like Luther did, <laughs> he still wants to use you, and he still can use you. Moving forward. He once said this, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. That's pretty good, all right. right. I wish I, I was going to say I made it up, but I'm like, no, nah, that's all right. Right? Do you actually believe that, though? Do you believe, because I think some of us this morning are gasping for spiritual air because we have stopped breathing. We're suffocating spiritually, don't understand why we're so anxious and angry all the time. We're not breathing, like, breathe. Which is why, as Christians, we, we understand God made our bodies. It's, I love this comparison because for those of us who have dealt with anxiety and depression, clinically, medically, right? One of the, it's amazing how God created our bodies, that if you move oxygen in and out of it, it does some pretty neat stuff. And drawing our attention to the idea of prayer as breathing, we, we realize that in those moments when we say, okay, breathe, but also talk to God, that that... Folks, I, I know we can throw that around as Christians because we don't know what to say. So we're like, just pray. Just, yeah. I don't want to deal with your mess, so I'll just tell you to pray about it. Come on. Love somebody. But seriously, in that moment, in that moment when you, you're, you're freaking out, you're, you're failing, and, and you're, you're broken, and per people have hurt you, all those different things, and you're like, breathe. And then breathe as a believer, which means go to your Father. It's this thing that should just constantly define our lives. And then we see him say, Luther also says this, which is equally crazy if you think about it. Work. Oh, sorry, let me give you preface for this. He's saying, he's talking to his friend. Don't read it yet. Don't read it yet. Look here. Right. He's talking to his friend and his friend is saying, thank you, thank you. Right. I got friends in high places. So he, he's talking to his friend and his friend's like, hey, hey, what you got going on tomorrow? You want to grab, you know, some disc golf, maybe, you know, do something fun. And he's like, well, well I don't know. I don't know. And this is what he says. I, I got work. Work from early until late. In fact, I have so much to do that I shall have to spend the first three hours in prayer. Folks, I don't know I've ever said that before. And man, I could, I, there's probably some time I said it and didn't really mean it. But I don't think I've, like, have you ever genuinely said, I am so slammed, I've got so much going on, my marriage is falling apart so much, this relationship with a child or grandchild is so disintegrating, my job is so blowing up, my schedule is so falling apart, I need a couple hours in prayer today, or I'm not going to make it. We just don't think that way a lot. We don't think that way a lot. Most of us cannot imagine that. But that's what he brings us to. He brings us, not Luther, <laughs> Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. He draws our attention to prayer. To prayer. Why? Because it's fueling something in us. It's changing something in us. 
But more importantly, God has obeyed, sorry, has called us to obey him in prayer because he wants to use that to change the world. He doesn't have to. He doesn't need your prayer. He wants your prayer. Do you get that this morning? Do you believe that this morning? Because it's so much easier to talk about prayer than to actually pray. Why do we think this way? Why are you struggling in your prayer life? Why don't we gather more as a church to pray? Maybe it's because we forget who sits on the throne. Maybe we forget who sits on the throne. But if Jesus is sitting on the throne of your life, you will pray. If he's on the throne, if you're keeping him on the throne, if you're intentionally worshiping him as the one who sits on the throne of your heart, the throne of your life, you will pray because you truly believe he has all authority in heaven and on earth. Because you truly believe he will be with you always, even to the end of the age. You will pray because you have this confidence that you can access the throne of grace, that you may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And when you pray, Jesus, by his grace, will use your prayer to change the world and to change your heart. Real quick, I just want to show you three things. These things that he's fueling through your prayer life. To keep you, to bring you into devotion. He's going to use your prayer life to fuel these things within you that draw your attention to him as king and draw your attention to his kingdom and the work he has for you to do. What he's given you to do. First, our unity in Christ. How are they praying? Look right there in verse 14. They're praying with unity in one accord. Notice the beauty of the fact that what does he list afterwards? He's just listed the apostles. They're with these 120 um, disciples, just like you and me. These aren't super Christians. They're Christians like you and me with their own problems, their own struggles, their own need to grow. But then he says all these in one accord, devoting themselves to prayer. And what does he say next? Together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. I think it's so beautiful, so powerful for us to realize, especially women in this room, who maybe you've had bad experiences in the church before. Maybe you've just been lied to before about what the church is. The church was never that. It was someone who was confused, someone who was broken, or someone who was just hard-hearted. But I want to invite you to look at the Word of God. You're invited to the table. And the beauty of this moment that he, that Luke wants to just really nail home in this world that thinks they're crazy, who, the world that would go out of the way to not include women, he says we are in one accord, accord and it includes the women. It includes them because they're valued, they're known, and they're beloved. They are co-heirs of the grace of life, as Peter says later in his letter. There's this beautiful unity. And what do we see this does? A time and time again throughout the word of God, praying together brings us together. Praying together brings us together. It's the power of the Holy Spirit as we're all lifting up our voices, all casting our thoughts to Christ and to the kingdom and to the Father who makes all this possible. It brings us together. And it's together that we advance the kingdom. Next, we see our longing for the Holy Spirit. For what were they praying? Well, it doesn't say specifically here, but we look back at verse 4, and he says, we're going to wait for them. You're going to wait because the Holy Spirit's going to come. The Holy Spirit's going to come. And so I want you to go to Jerusalem. And what's their instinct? Once again, what they've been taught, go pray. Because what do we see in the life of Jesus again and again? That he goes and prays. He prays. He draws them to himself. And he prays. And so as they're getting ready to face, you know, they, know, they have, I think they have a sense of what they're going up against, which is why they're huddling and crawling around in an upper room. Because they know the danger that lies ahead of them. But what are they praying for? They're praying for the Holy Spirit to come and fill them to move and work among them and through them. They're praying for the Holy Spirit to do His thing. 
So in our prayer, as we ask God to move through the Holy Spirit, we again and again and again fuel our hearts with this longing and yearning for the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. It draws our attention to walk and step with the Holy Spirit like we see elsewhere in Scripture. And then next we see our dependence on God. So it fuels our dependence. Folks, one of my seminary professors, uh, his name is Jared Wilson, he taught us prayer is acknowledged helplessness. Let me say that again. Prayer is acknowledged helplessness. And then he turned around and he said, well, if we consider its power, it's more like weaponized helplessness. It's weaponized helplessness. It's you laying down your life and saying, I am completely incapable of glorifying you apart from you. That echoing the words of Jesus, I can do nothing apart from you. And it's in that where I find power. It's where I lower myself in prayer that as I'm asking and I'm thanking, I'm giving all the glory to him, I'm giving all my need to him, I'm giving all my heart to him, where I'm laying myself down saying, I am powerless. That's where I find power. That's where you find power. Because it's not even your own power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the power of the living God living inside of you. Do you all get that? You all don't seem excited enough if you really get it. Like, do you get that? Like, you lower yourself and he lifts you up. If you would humble yourself, I would exalt you. I give grace to the humble, but I crush the prideful. He wants to lift you up up oh folks if we could believe that as a church if we could believe those words as a church then we'd pray something like this when we face hard situations they prayed and said you lord who know the hearts of all right there he's like they're acknowledging we don't know we can't see this and justice and matthias they're they're good guys I can't decide, Lord. We need you because you know the hearts of all. And notice what it says next. Show which of these two you have chosen. You could say you have already chosen. Because again, God has spoken. And so they acknowledge what they're going into. They lay it at his feet. And we see this pattern that I can't get into now. It's in Acts, over and again, where we see the people of God proclaiming the gospel. Then they face this seemingly impossible problem. And then they pray because they've been praying and they keep praying. And then we see the power of the the power of God pour out in so many different ways. Just read your Bible, folks. You see the people of God doing the work of God when enemies come against them, when brokenness comes among them. They pray because they've been praying. And that's what we see here, folks. This is this is what we need next. We must make coming together to pray together in one accord a regular fixture in the pattern of our life together as a church. Wow, Jared, that's a lot of words. Let me simplify it. We need to come together to pray together in our life together. If that's not how you see the church, I'd like to introduce you to Christ because that's what he's trying to tell you again and again and again. If you're like, whoa, 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 Jared, I pray on my own. I got my own devotional time. I've got this creek out back, and I just sit there, and it's beautiful. Well, that is awesome. Oh, my goodness. And the creek bit, I am slightly jealous. Lord, help me now. Right? But that's good. In fact, that's where it needs to start. If your relationship with God is dependent upon being with us, you've got a problem we need to talk about. But here's the thing. Your relationship starts, only starts there. But everything God has done in saving you is to bring you not into yourself, but bring you into himself and into his people. Folks, we need more prayer together in the life of our church. I've been saying this, and, and I've, I've been work, we're, we're starting to get there as we're trying to form our calendar, and I, you, can, you can talk to me about this. I've been chomping at the bit to get prayer together, and I'm trying to respect your schedules, and I'm about to go stir-crazy by myself over here. 
You can, you, you can find me all the time just walking in here, walking around. I'm praying for you, and I'm praying that this would be a place of prayer. I'm praying that your home would be a place of prayer. I pray that you in that, that quiet place where you go to his word and you go to the Lord in prayer, that you would find him there. But then we would come together and lift up the name of Jesus, that the spirit would move in a powerful way that would transform our community and bring glory to his name. The only reason you see me all excited, yeah, part of it's my personality, but part of it I am convinced is because the Lord brings this passion in me. He fuels it because constantly I'm going to him and saying, like, do something, God. I'm ready. Do something, God. I'm ready. Do something, God. I need, I need your help on that because I wasn't called to do it alone. I am not your sanctified holy man, right, or hired holy man, I think is the funner term. Right where I'm here, I'm your intercessor. No, we, we were freed from that. You're the priesthood. I'm just the crazy guy leading you. But even that, God is over all of this. Folks, we've got to come together in prayer. We've got to come to brother, together in prayer because we weren't meant to do this alone. I could finish right there, but i got to make one final point because this is so crucial and God's word leads us here, so I want to leave you there. If our devotion is going to go, it has to be on a foundation, devoted to a foundation of the word. It has to be devoted to being fueled individually, in our families, and in our church family by this fuel of prayer that's changing us, bringing us together in unity, moving us to long for the Holy Spirit and lowering us to be devoted and be dependent upon God that he would lift us up. But we can't stop there because we are called to a faith that acts. As we read the acts of the apostle, pun intended, we are called to a faith that acts, that actually at some point has to do something. If we just get a, a prayer gathering that's going to meet on one, I've got all sorts of ideas, but we got that going on. But then we don't actually go, then our devotion still isn't to God. And I, I'm a, I want to make sure I, I speak to some of you who I, I, I know love the word of God. And you want to grow in your prayer life. But maybe you're just feeling so paralyzed by this idea that you feel, man, I just got, I, have I read enough to really go? Do I, do I have all the answers collected together in this knapsack of, of evan, evangelizing? I don't know. I, have, have I prayed enough? Have I, have I stopped enough? Have we prayed enough before? And you just, you get paralyzed. You get burdened and think, I can't do anything. And I want to free you, like, at some point, We've got to step out. Look here. In Acts. Right? We'll, we'll skip. Let's, let's go to the next one, just for the sake of time. Right, right there at the end. They prayed. They've looked at the word. They've seen what the word says. And then they say they cast lots for him. Anyone else, who, when you read that, you went, wait, what? Do we have some divine dice around here that I don't know about? Like, what? I don't think this is, this is what I like to call descriptive, not prescriptive. It's describing what they're doing, but they did not just command every church that claims the name of Jesus to have some dice up here and be like, okay, so what color is the carpet? Right? Like, that's not what this is supposed to be. But instead, I think they, they're at the standstill. They're, they're figuring stuff out. God sees them where they're at. And you know what they do? I think they're actually just reacting to the word of God. Look at this, Proverbs. Chapter 16, verse 33, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. I think Peter's like, hands up, like, folks, okay, the word has spoken. We need this. I love both these guys. I would die for both of these guys. I probably will die with both of these guys, but I don't know which one. <laughs> right. Here we go. <laughs> I think, I think they are so saturated in the word of God that this is their reflex. So like, this is what the word says. I've got nothing else. Let's just go for it and trust that God is in control. Again, descriptive, not prescriptive. We're not going to get some sanctified dice up in here. Okay, but what we see is that at some point they have to act. They have to move. So our final question, how are you acting out your devotion to King Jesus and his mission? On the 4th, we celebrate our country. I'll say this and then run. Actually, I won't even say this. You got it. Here's the thing. We act out our devotion to our country time and time again in a, in a host of different ways. 
we act out our devotion as we go to the polls, as we vote, as we talk about issues. How are you acting out your devotion to Christ as king? Because if you've stopped at just having a relatively moral life, being a, you know, I'm a good, decent person. I love my family. I take care of my people. But he's given you a mission. He's given you a calling in this life. So where are you actively, actively seeking to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Where are you actively stepping into relationships like our Bible study groups? Like some of us men, we've started a discipleship group, something I'm hoping will grow in our church, continue to bring people into these kind of relationships. Where are you intentionally, actively being discipled by others so you can grow more and more like Jesus Christ? Where are you actively discipling others in this church or in a church to be more and more like Christ? Yes, that discipleship starts in your personal relationship with God. Yes, you should be actively doing that in your own family. But God has given you a community of disciples where you are a part of a body so that you can be engaged actively in making disciples, not just converts. Not just people that the community can go, yeah, those are good people, yeah. But people to lift up the glory of Jesus' name. Now I say all that. I say all that. But that's a lot of, hey, you do this, some stuff. And at some point you're going to realize this is impossible without the work of Christ. But I have good news that we see right here at the table. Christ has come. And we remember the fact that even in the midst of our brokenness and our insufficiencies, in the midst of our sin and our failures, Jesus was broken for us. Jesus poured himself out for us, brought us into this new covenant, not a covenant for some earthly nation that could crumble and fall, but instead into a people that would be a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. So they might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into marvelous light. So we remember that, but maybe this morning we need to reflect like we just asked. I, I'm proclaiming my devotion to the king, echoing baptism. That's what we do at the Lord's Supper. We're, we're proclaiming we belong to Christ. What is your life proclaiming? What is your calendar and your thoughts and your passions proclaiming? What is actually important to you? Where, is your, where your devotion is actually at? So this morning as we come to the table, maybe some of us need to even abstain from the table because we're claiming that Jesus is our king, but we're looking at our life and we're seeing some major gaps. We can see some places we're actively refusing to live out the mission of our king, actively rebelling against him. And we don't need to come to this table yet because we need to get right with God. And so maybe you need to abstain for that reason because that's what the Bible calls us to. But some of us maybe just need to reflect and repent and return right here at this table and say, Lord, welcome me to the table by your grace, Lord. Welcome me to this table. And then rejoice in the fact that our king is coming back. We believe that the Lord's Supper is a memorial to the redeeming work and promised return of Jesus Christ. It may be partaken of by any person who has confessed their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, having publicly professed their faith through scriptural baptism. If our ushers and deacons could come and sit at the front at this point.